Fediwap is going to serve a bare minimum of 1,825 days in prison, and he's facing up to 40 years for the crimes of conspiring to distribute over 500 grams of cocaine. But in 2015, he was on top of the world and had the music game in a chokehold. You heard at least one of his songs every day, multiple times per day for over a year straight. His first four songs he ever released debuted in the top 10 on the Billboard Hot Rap charts and remained in the top 10 simultaneously, something that was never done before. He even has the rare achievement of earning a diamond single, which is 10 million records sold. Fetty Wap made basically every wrong decision one could make throughout his entire career. He stayed loyal to the wrong people, made terrible financial decisions, and sabotaged his own career. Most people have no idea what even happened to him. How did he go from being a beloved superstar to a drug trafficking kingpin? Well, the story is even more tragic than we thought. Willie Maxwell had all the odds stacked against him, starting with the day he went blind. He was born with glaucoma, which in short causes fluid to build up in the eyes, putting pressure on the optic nerve and making it hard to see. At six months old, he had reconstructive eye surgery, and luckily the doctor was able to save one of them. Then at age 12, he decided he didn't like the prosthetic eye and embraced showing his blind eye. I was born with glaucoma, and I lost the eye at six months, and I got reconstructive surgery when I was 12, uh -huh. and I just stopped wearing the prosthesis because because I didn't want to look like everybody else. To make matters worse, he grew up on the rough streets of Patterson, New Jersey, 22nd and 12th Street to be exact. Kids would bully him because of his eye, so he had to learn how to defend himself at an early age. However, he had one escape, and that was music. Willie played the drums alongside his father, his brother, and uncle in the local church. He was constantly surrounded by music and was putting on performances even as a child. He even took his talents to the school band, but Willie didn't like school, and the kids didn't like him, which led him to dropping out as a teenager. He got his nickname Fetty because he was always trying to get the money, but he never had a job, so he hit the streets to pay his bills. His family didn't support his lifestyle, so he resorted to sleeping on friends' couches and floors. As if times couldn't get any harder, he had his first child. He was broke with no plan and destined for failure until he met Monty, who introduced a way out. Monty was a local rapper in Patterson who introduced Fetty to the music scene. P. Dice and Knit the Grit were other artists who had a little bit of buzz in the city. P. Dice, Monty, Fetty, and a few others started calling themselves the Remy Boys, based on their love for Remy Martin's 1738 Cognac. The third song Fetty ever recorded was Trap Queen. He always knew it was a hit, but it went unnoticed for years. Knit the Grit saw potential in the group and decided to quit his own rap career and start a production company slash label called RGF Productions, and he signed them. But Knit was new to the business, and he needed help promoting his artists. He got connected with Muscle Team Fuzz, who is an OG in Patterson, rapper, CEO, community leader, among other things. Fuzz took Knit under his wing, showed him how to move like a boss, and how to get the support of Patterson. Fetty getting involved with these guys would be the best and the worst thing that ever happened to him. Knit and the Remy boys would stand outside of Broadway Pizza and Patterson selling CDs. Fetty was okay with the traditional way of getting poppin' locally because his only goal was to get lit in his city. He never thought he had more potential than that, but once they took to the internet, everything changed. Fetty posted Trap Queen on his SoundCloud and YouTube, then promoted it on Instagram every single day trying to make some noise online. Despite his efforts, it was mostly unnoticed, gaining about 1,000 streams per day. At the time, he also released 679 with Monty and P. Dice. Knit and Fuzz knew these guys were making hits, and they were using all their connections in New Jersey and New York City to get these songs played in the clubs. Fuzz's artist Franco linked up with Fetty to make the song Zoop. This one was getting even more traction than Trap Queen. With RGF and Muscle Team Entertainment working together, Patterson was unified and about to put New Jersey on the map. By September 2014, Fetty Wap was a local star. Even in the middle of the internet age, Fetty managed to blow up the traditional way, in his city. One month later, Bobby Shmurda, who was at the peak of his career, posted a video of himself singing Trap Queen on Instagram. Blogs started covering the song, he did his first interview with Complex, and the internet was trying to figure out who this one-eyed rapper was. He secured a record deal with 300 Entertainment. However, they gave him a small advance of $200,000 because they didn't believe in his other songs. They only thought Trap Queen was a hit. 300 started pushing Trap Queen to radio stations all over the country, and in the beginning of 2015, the music video started gaining over 200,000 views per day. Funk Flex debuted a remix with French Montana on Hot 97. Rihanna said in an interview that it was the last song she purchased. Then Kanye brought out Fetty to perform at the Rock City Classic in New York City. Shortly after, Trap Queen debuted at number 86 on the Billboard Hot 100, one year after it was posted and two years after it was recorded. He went from local legend to mainstream household name in just a few months, but he didn't want all the fame for himself. Like I had a plan of how this shit was supposed to go. You know what I'm saying? Like 
And that was supposed to be Monty's record. That was Monty's breakthrough record. Like, he was supposed to, boom, all right, Fetty Wap. Fetty Wap goes on tour. Monty goes on tour. You know what I'm saying? It was it supposed to be Fetty Wap and then Monty on the tour with Fetty Wap. The record he was talking about was My Way. The now three times platinum record was supposed to be Monty's breakout single. It was actually Monty's song to begin with, but Drake heard it in the club, asked Fetty through Instagram DMs if he could remix a song. Fetty asked Drake if he could just leave Fetty on the hook, remove his verse, and just have Drake and Monty on the verses. But the OVO team kicked Monty off the song and released it on SoundCloud without Fetty's approval and spoiled Monty's debut. The song was blowing up on the internet, but neither Fetty nor 300 Records ever really promoted the song. It wasn't even available on iTunes or streaming because Fetty didn't like the way Drake handled that business. Instead, they re-released the old track 679 to focus more on the Remy Boys. 679 hit Billboard immediately. Then a month later, his fourth single, Again, also hit the top 10 on the Billboard Hot Rap charts. By mid-2015, Fetty had his first four singles in regular rotation on the radio, but the fame never got to his head. When he made his first million dollars, he gave it to Knit the Grit for signing him to RGF and making all of this possible. But Fetty spent his money recklessly. The most superstar thing I've done, I spent a lot of money. I can right. say that. On this particular trip, I was like eight million. On one trip. Yeah. Well, we go to the hotel and the hotel like, yo, we don't have enough rooms. And I'm like, you know what? Uh, I don't want to hear this. Right. Call my man like, yo, I need a house right now. Right. He's like, you want to rent it? I'm like, nah, I'm just going to buy it. Oh like, man, I got a sure? good. I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna buy it. I was doing like 150,000 a month bills, but I was see that's the dumbest shit I was doing. Like, matter of fact, yeah, if I had to, it was jewelry and like apartments. I had a lot of fucking apartments. I was traveling with 14, 15 niggas, 16 niggas, maybe sometimes 30 niggas. My worst shopping experiences was Barney's when the Balmain shit came out. Yeah, we talking about 13, 14, 1500 pair of jeans, bro. I'm buying 30 pair of jeans now, mind you. I'm only wearing one pair, but we spending forty five. I'm spending forty five thousand on this motherfucker on jeans, bro. I ain't even get my shirt yet. Fetty would travel with fifteen to thirty people, paying for all of their expenses, buying them all chains, spending forty five thousand dollars on jeans just so everyone could have a pair, bringing them all on stage during his shows. He wanted to show everyone the lifestyle, not because he felt pressure, but because he genuinely loved his people. When his debut album was finalized, he took the Drake feature off of My Way to help Monty, which seems honorable, but this genuinely hurt his career. And Nit the Grit didn't step in to try to force Fetty to do it. Drake and Fetty never talked again. One thing about me at that time bro nobody could tell me shit like at that at that time in my life like 2015 2016 you couldn't tell me nothing the selfishness part was me that wasn't for nobody else that was me i knew a certain shit i could have did to make my shit better but i ain't want to like bro a lot of shit that i went through i'm I, like i said i'm happy all that shit happened but yeah for the most part a lot of that shit was my fault bro like unfortunately in the music industry you have to make sacrifices fetty didn't care his management let him be the boss and make the decisions he felt more like a regular dude than an industry dude he hated the idea of connecting with celebrities and networking he thought it was all fake he wanted to be with his real friends in new jersey he gave everyone from jersey a feature for free he hated interviews he was quiet and humble he focused on everyone but himself which is respectable but not marketable and not good for business. Unfortunately, no matter how much love he showed to the people around him, despite all the money he shared, it got bad for Fetty and they turned on him. Yeah, everybody got that shit. Everybody, it's, if you from the hood and you make it out, it's the hood curse. It's like, um, <clears throat> so it, it go like this, right? So first is, that shit ain't gonna be, blah, 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 and then it's gonna be like, oh, he got some shit going. And then it's like everybody supporting you. Oh, yeah, we gonna make it. He about to make it. Da, 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 da. And then when you make it, it's like, all right, well, he ain't come back and do this. And he ain't da, 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 da. And that's the hook. Chris. Fetty took care of a lot of people, gave them money, gave them opportunities. What they did with that was up to them. He realized some people took the money and expected more handouts, and some people used it to genuinely kickstart their own careers. But the first fallout started with P. Dice, who was on the last verse of 679, in which Fetty removed from his album. P. Dice wasn't around much, and most people don't even remember him as part of the Remy Boys. What I told Dice was, if you gonna be a Remy Boy, be a Remy Boy till it's time for you to branch off, branch off the right way and bring your team up, my nigga. Don't come do shows here, do shows there, and think I'm gonna pay you like I'm paying everybody else. It don't work that way, my nigga. I could do three shows and be good for a couple months, my nigga. You just can't wait for that. That wasn't what you wanted. That wasn't, that wasn't, it was, it was taking too long for P. Dice. Monty? Monty's well taken care of.
but Dice says that the beef originated with Tax G, a New Jersey rapper who claims that Fetty Wap stole his sound and look. Then Dice got into an altercation with Tax G, and in response they pressed Fetty Wap and said, either we go after Dice or all of y'all, and Fetty dropped Dice to avoid the beef with Tax G. We don't know if Dice is telling the truth, but a video did go on the internet of him getting jumped. They ripped me with it at first, then I hit the ground, pop back up, that's when, that's when the tussle started. One of them was like, yo, what you want to do? Da -da -da -da. I mean, the other one was like, nah, I ain't that serious. And that's when the phone came out. That's when the recorder started, so. Now people knew this was serious. Pete Dice started plotting his get back. In the meantime, Fetty had another big song with Lil Dicky called Save That Money. A song with David Guetta, a big song with Kid Ink, one with K-Camp, and another huge one with Fifth Harmony called In My Head. He cruised through 2016 with a bunch of big features. His last big solo song was called Wake Up, which some people consider a hit, but he wasn't even coming close to matching the takeover he had the year prior. Then he found out his own label could have been preventing his growth. Nit the Grit has to sign off on everything Thing that Fetty does. Fetty was loyal to Nit since he brought him up from nothing. Apparently Future, Justin Bieber, and Beyonce all wanted to take Fetty on a world tour during his peak, but Nit tried to negotiate having the Remy Boys and RGF artists on the bill, and obviously they weren't interested. They just wanted Fetty. Allegedly, Nit denied all of these tours and had Fetty go on his own solo tour with the other RGF artists so that Nit could grow his roster instead of catapulting Fetty into even more fame. Nit says that Fetty was the one who didn't want to do it and that he wanted to stay loyal to his guys. Nit also admits that he had very little business experience and knowledge. He also admits that the lawyer he hired to represent them all the way back to the first deal with 300 wasn't exactly the most top of the line entertainment lawyer. If Fetty had gone on any one of those tours, his buzz probably Probably would have lasted much longer. So it's unclear if Nit was trying to sabotage them intentionally, his lack of experience hurt them, or if it was Fetty just being stubborn. Because as we know, after 2016, Fetty Wap seemingly disappeared. But he wasn't even welcome in his hometown. P. Dice linked up with Muscle Team Fuzz, and they condemned Fetty from coming back to Patterson. So Fetty Wap, did you like that? And you saying, you, you run the city, we gonna be on your block shooting this fucking video. You know what I'm saying? Right. With, with your niggas. A bunch of Patterson rappers filmed a diss track on 22nd and 12th where Fetty is from just to prove that Fetty was not a real gangster and he didn't run anything in Patterson. A few months later there would be a robbery involving Fetty where three people got shot with non-critical injuries. His chain got stolen and Fuzz posted himself on Instagram wearing it. Fetty allegedly reported the stolen property to the police which got Fuzz locked up. Fetty even dissed P Dice in his 2017 track called A, but most of you are probably wondering why Fetty would still be beefing with the guys from his hood after two years of being mainstream. Well, Fetty's pride started to act up. He thought he did nothing but good for his city, did everything he could to help as many people as possible, and they still were not happy. He said in 2017, he started to wake up and realize how messed up his life was. Like 2017, that's, that shit was like a different year for me. You feel me? Like all jokes aside, like I was a little fucked up that year, man. Like I was, really, uh, you see, I started number chasing. So in my mind, I'm like, Oh, I'm done. It's over. Fetty Wap is over with. Like <laughs> Fetty was scrambling to get his finances in order. He had to clean house, downsize his team, and make sure he doesn't go broke. He looked at Nit. He started to question what he even did for him in the first place. Nit gets paid before Fetty does, so he needed to assess if he was actually helping his career. Literally since 2017, Fetty hasn't been on good terms with the man who pays him and has to approve every song, every show, every brand deal, literally everything he does. How can a career progress from there? Well, it can't. By 2018, everyone forgot about Fetty Wap. Granted, most of this happened behind closed doors. People have very fond memories of him. He didn't go out sad, he didn't embarrass himself. He just kind of faded away and nobody really asked any questions. I fell off musically by being popular, but I, 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 I built myself to be able to, to, to bring myself back up. Despite spending money recklessly, Fetty prides himself on being very good with his money. But the charges he was found guilty on strongly suggest that it wasn't just his music money that kept him rich all these years. In October of 2021, Fetty Wap was arrested after he got off stage at Rolling Loud in New York. He was charged with conspiracy to distribute and possess controlled substances. The press release showed that the officers seized 16 kilograms of cocaine, 2 kilograms of heroin, numerous fentanyl pills, two 9mm handguns, a rifle, a 40 caliber pistol, and ammunition. 
Maxwell, along with five others, allegedly trafficked more than 100 kilos of opioids, including fentanyl, heroin, cocaine, and crack, from the West Coast and sold the deadly drugs in New Jersey and across Long Island, officials said. Now this is big time drug dealing, not just some small operation. However, a couple weeks later, he got out on a $500,000 bond. It was a big story for sure, but I feel a lot of his mainstream audience didn't even know about this. Plus, he went right out and did a bunch of podcasts, interviews, and went on a press tour for his 2021 album, The Butterfly Effect. This album slipped totally under the radar because it had no hits on it. Fast forward in summer of 2022, his bond was revoked after allegedly threatening to end someone while pointing a strap at them on a FaceTime call. So he was arrested again. In August, he pled guilty to one count of intent to distribute controlled substances, including cocaine, heroin, and fentanyl. He still is yet to be sentenced, but he's facing a minimum of five years. But the biggest question everyone wants answered, why? Is this a setup? Is he actually a kingpin drug lord? Why didn't he just make music? Well, I obviously don't know anything about the streets, but I did find a clip explaining the mentality a little bit. I'm sure Fetty could still get 20,000 a show, but that ain't enough for the lifestyle he created. Can't keep up. So you like, I'm gonna take my last. I'm gonna put it here. I got my little cousin them, my little homie them. Shit, I don't gotta touch this shit. I'm gonna make a play, buy some bags, put these niggas on. We got straps, we good. And that fast, you're in organized crime. People assume that Fetty was getting money in the streets and that's why he didn't need to keep making music. Maybe that's true. Maybe all the beefs with the guys in Patterson was not actually about music, popularity, and jealousy. Maybe something a little bit deeper and darker. Maybe Fetty Wap is just not who we expected him to be. Or maybe he's being set up. Which in that case, maybe his management is the reason why his career spiraled. They never believed he would be bigger than Trap Queen, and he had to fight to prove himself to his own team. Then when he made multiple hits, his pride got in the way of advancing any further. Maybe his own ego got in the way, and he just simply did not want to be famous. In one year, he made enough money to last him a lifetime, and maybe he was okay with that. Just wanted to focus on being a normal person, just like you and me.